So hello everyone, let's begin. I'm Laurel Steinmanoff, the Executive Director for Quality and Innovation at the Urgent Care Association. I would all like to welcome you all to our third COVID-19 Town Hall. Our facilitator today is Dr. Sean McNeely, an Urgent Care Fellow, former UCA board member and president, as well as the immediate pre past president of the College of Urgent Care Medicine. Dr. McNeely will be joined by some esteemed panelists in urgent care medicine to discuss the timely subject of back to school in 2020. Additionally, we encourage you to watch a webinar hosted by UCA with presenters of Dr. Joseph Toscano, Dr. Thomas Tryon, and a representative from the CDC regarding acute flaccid myelitis. Um, apologize, my thing's not working here. There we go. Um, they are predicting a peak year for AFM and this fall, and we want to remind everyone of this available education, uh, particularly because it can present after a viral illness. A few housekeeping items before we begin. There are uh, two ways to ask questions depending on how you are accessing the webinar. For today, this is an interactive session, so please put your questions into the question section on the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will answer them as we go or at the end. We are trying to allow adequate time at the end of this presentation for your questions. Um, if you are watching the recording, you can use the question feature on the UCA 2020 app to submit questions and we'll share them with our experts and get back to you with the answers that will be taking place obviously in the future. At the end of the session, we will have short evaluation. We appreciate your feedback um, and so we can continue to improve. The evaluation will be for those watching as included in the UCA 2020 app as well. Uh, we also forward a copy of the recording to all of you joining us today. With that, I'm going to turn it over right now to Dr. McNeely. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, whatever it might be, depending on your uh, time zone. I can never figure that one out this afternoon here on the East Coast, unless you're listening to this uh, um, via recording. Thanks for joining us. We have a great panel today. We're gonna be talking about Back to School 2020. Some people are already back to school, but others are heading in that direction. We'll be talking about how to deal with the pandemic and where things are. We have some great information today. And as uh, Laurel said, we're going to have lots of time for questions. So make sure that you're putting the questions in the app. I'll be watching those as we go through. Next slide. All right. So introductions. You've already heard from me. Dr. Chow is an urgent care physician with Wake Med in Raleigh, North Carolina. He's on the board of directors of the College of Urgent Care Medicine and serves as the treasurer. Chris Acerno is the owner of Acute Kids Pediatric Urgent Care in Rochester, New York, and is pra practicing emergency medicine and urgent care physician assistant. She's a mom of three young kids and serves as a secretary at the College of Urgent Care Medicine. Dr. Toscano practices emergency and urgent care medicine in the San Francisco area, Bay Area, is the clinical content coordinator for UCA, and is a founding and current board member of the College of Urgent Care Medicine. Dr. Davidoff could not join us today. Next slide. So there are no disclosures. Next slide. Our learning objectives are below. I won't read them off to you. I'll let you have a second to take a peek. And then our next slide. So return to school. Why does this matter to urgent care? Well, like everything else, when things aren't working well, when there's a, no place to go and people don't know what to do, they turn to urgent care. So it's very important that we understand what's happening this fall and that we know what to do and have a plan for when people show up. Um, we know that about a third of kids are going to be doing online classes, which means they won't be in direct contact, um, but there'll be some issues with how they deal with that. Um, some kids will be going back to school Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, or something like that, and others will be doing a full return. We know that masks will be pretty much the uh, request of everybody, there's going to be some issues with that, you know, contact dermatitis, how to wear the mask, are they wearing the mask properly, did it hurt their ears, all types of things that could happen with wearing a mask. Hand washing will be present. Um, we'll expect that um, Purell and some of the other um, hand washing, or not hand washing, but uh, 
hand sanitizer and hand washing issues will present. We may see some dermatitis, we may see some irritation, inflammation, making sure that we're remembering that the kids are doing things that they didn't do, they should have been doing, but aren't doing as much as they uh, or are doing more than they have in the past. Um, plexiglass is going to be all over the place. People are going to be in between that. People are going to be cleaning with all types of different chemicals and compounds, and let's hope they get them clean and they bring everything off. But we need to remember that dermatitis can result from those types of things. So that is the reality of what school is going to look like um, as things go on. Next slide. Can we get to the next slide? All right, so the reality, like they said, children are gonna to be together once again. Take a look at that picture. Nobody's wearing the mask that they're supposed to be wearing. I guess there's one child there. They're all congregating in a pile. We're gonna see illness spread. Um, we're gonna see fear. People are gonna be anxious. People are gonna be concerned. Parents are gonna be upset. They're gonna be worried. They're gonna wonder what's happening to their poor little kid and what's going on in school. People are gonna be exposed and they're gonna wonder what that means. So what does an exposure mean? So according to the CDC, if you're within six feet, of someone with COVID-19 for 15 minutes, or you're taking care of them as a caregiver, or you're hugging and kissing them, or you're sharing utensils or drinking out of cups. And we say, why would we be doing that during a pandemic? Well, um, we're seeing lots of reports of people sharing cups and people, I'm sure you're seeing them coming into your urgent care. I shared a glass with someone who was COVID-19 yesterday. Um, and uh, defining exposure is important. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, related to that. Um, we're going to see ill symptoms. We're going to see strep again. We're going to see flu as the, as the season goes on. And people are going to want diagnoses and they're going to want treatment. Um, there's the return to school notes. It's very important that we think about that. And then the parents are going to have to stay home to watch some of these kids. So there's return to work notes. It'll be something we need to think about. Next slide. So what do we do? So first, connect with your local schools. What's their plan? What do they expect from you? What do they expect for return to work? Connect with your local health department. Health departments are usually the ones that tell the school whether they can let people back or not. Watch the CDC website to see how things are changing. You know, at one point it was 14 days and 72 hours without symptoms. Now it's 10 days and 24 hours without a fever um, or significant increase or worsening of symptoms. Develop a test policy. What do I mean by that? Well, tests are in short supply whether we like it or not. So who are we gonna test? I know there are facilities that are only testing people that are symptomatic. There are facilities that are only testing symptomatic and those that have been exposed. What are you gonna test them for? When are you gonna test for stress? When are you gonna test for flu? When are you gonna test for COVID? Who should be tested? When's the test gonna occur? Are you gonna retest? Um, remember that the CDC no longer recommends retesting of anybody because we feel that the COVID, particularly with some of the PCR tests, the little strands of DNA and RNA hang out in our nose and we test that two weeks later or three weeks or four weeks later, we may still get a positive test if the person is not infectious to others. Um, will we be repeating the test? You know, if a person comes in today, they're exposed yesterday and they're negative, do we repeat it in 48 hours? Do we repeat it in 24 hours? Will you be doing that? What's your policy? Um, very important that you know that, you think about it. Unfortunately, there is no national policy and with all the different testing formats we have out there, you're really going to have to be on your own a little bit, but have that policy. Now, you also want to assure that you have a way to provide the results. So a patient comes in, you swab them for COVID, they turn out positive in 24 hours because you don't have a rapid test. You don't want them walking back in to get a test result. You don't want them walking back in to get the return to work or school notes. How are you going to get it to them? What's the best way? You don't want your staff spending the entire day returning results or calling back results. How are you going to do that? Those are really important things you need to think about. And that's my list for what to think about before return to school. I'm going to pass the, the baton over to Dr. Chow, who's going to talk about um, the difference between strep and, and flu and what have you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, next slide, please. So everywhere you turn in the media, there are reports of experts predicting that this may be the worst fall flu season slash infectious disease season in the history of the United States. The reason why we're concerned is flu season typically starts in October. The estimated annual influenza burden 
from 2010 to 2019 is about 140 to as high as 810,000 hospitalizations per year with 12,000 to 61,000 deaths per year. The concern is our ICU and hospital bed capacity, that if we're running above average or close to capacity for COVID, do we have room for both the COVID and influenza patients that require hospitalizations? That's the primary concern. Next slide, please. One important caveat when assessing the COVID patient is avoid tunnel vision. Not every patient who presents to urgent care or primary care with fever has COVID or even should be suspected of having COVID. Keep in mind the differential diagnosis includes viral upper respiratory infection, influenza, strep pharyngitis, viral pharyngitis, bacterial pneumonia, pyelonephritis, gastroenteritis. In the summer, we do have to worry about spotted fever, rotesbiosis, and COPD exacerbation. One of the patients that was referred to our COVID clinic was a 30-some-year-old female breastfeeding with a painful breast and red swollen breast, was referred to COVID clinic because she had said she had a fever. Next slide, please. The primary differences between influenza and COVID, there's really a lot of similarities, at least with the presenting symptoms. However, there are some differences. Influenza is obviously caused by the influenza A and B virus, and COVID-19 is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Influenza typically has an incubation period of about one to four days, whereas COVID the incubation period is a lot longer, which is problematic, two to, 12, two to 12 to 14 days. The duration of influenza generally lasts a few days, although in severe cases, symptoms may persist up to 14 days. In COVID, patients are considered contagious for up to 10 days and only if symptom-free, i.e. fever-free, for greater than 24 hours. Influenza is primarily transmitted by respiratory droplets, and while COVID is thought to be transmitted by respiratory droplets, there is some concern that there may be some airborne transmission or fomite transmission, although the primary transmission is still respiratory droplets. Between influenza and COVID, the primary different symptom with COVID is the new loss of taste or smell. Everything else is pretty similar. With influenza, treatment is supportive care, although there are approved antivirals for outpatient therapy, including oseltamivir, beloxavir, and zanavimir, whereas COVID-19, there is no current outpatient treatment and no treatment that is you know, FDA approved or EUA. There is a vaccine for influenza, which is historically 40 to 60% effective, and there is no current vaccine available in the United States for COVID-19. Next slide, please. What about group A strep pharyngitis? Bacterial pharyngitis uh, is 15 to 30% is caused by group A strep in children and 5 to 20% in adults. Keep in mind that there is colonization of group A strep, aka asymptomatic carriers, up to 20% in children, up to 5% in adults. The clinical presentation of strep is, can be similar to COVID and influenza. However, it's not associated with rhinitis, cough, or chest congestion. They typically have a sudden onset fever, headaches, red swollen tonsils, with or without exudates. Center score is a tool that may help you decide if a patient needs testing. Next slide, please. The treatment for group A strep remains penicillin or amoxicillin as first-line treatment. Why do you treat strep? Because you want to reduce symptom duration, you want to reduce infectivity, and you want to reduce the risk of complications, peritonsular abscess, acute rheumatic fever, post nephritis, and PANDAS is a potential complication of group, strep, group A strep pharyngitis. Next slide, please. 
Bottom line with influenza strep testing, please understand the prevalence of influenza and COVID-19 in your area because the pro positive predictive value and negative predictive value are dependent on pretest risk assessment and the prevalence of the illness. Influenza is and still is a clinical diagnosis and treatment may be initiated solely on clinical diagnosis. Molecular tests are recommended for influenza testing because the rapid tests really have poor sensitivity. And this goes into what Joe is going to talk about. Testing everyone with a sore throat for strep increases costs and may result in unnecessary antibiotic treatment for strep colonization. Next slide. And that's the end of my segment. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chow. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Toscano talking about why the shotgun approach probably isn't the best idea. Um, unless someone's at your front door, right? All right, on to Dr. Just Next, yeah, next slide, please. Great, so so here's the challenge. It's a challenge that we face, you know, most winters, but now we have COVID in addition. We have um, common cold viruses, RSV, uh, flu, and uh, group A beta hemolytic strep causing pharyngitis as well as other organisms similar to before, um, but now we have COVID-19 added to the mix. So we can anticipate unless this thing disappears that we're gonna have COVID-19 added to the mix. The, the symptoms that people present with include sore throat and cough. Um, actually uh, talking to a couple friends in upstate New York recently who had kids come in with croup who tested positive for COVID-19. Um, so it's probably the case that it can settle in that part of the respiratory tract uh, and cause those symptoms in, um, in the right demographic group. Um, and then pneumonia and GI symptoms. Um, a lot of these organisms can cause one or more of those symptoms with a lot of overlap between, between those organisms. How are we gonna be able to tell them apart? Um, Chris brought up the fact that um, COVID-19 and group A beta hemolytic strep both have uh, asymptomatic carrier states. It's the case for flu too, probably not as well studied. We don't know how many patients are walking around spreading influenza without necessarily being sick, but it's the case that you know, those patients are in the mix as well. Um, we have our usual tests for flu and strep as we have had before. And now we have all these tests for COVID-19. Some of them are rapid tests, some of them give us delayed results. Uh, how do we use those uh, and not use all of them in every patient to make uh, the right decisions? And that, that's challenging, admittedly. Chris had talked about the fact that um, Influenza is considered a clinical diagnosis. We have testing for influenza. Um, interestingly, when influenza is prevalent in the community, the CDC says that you don't have to test, um, that you can make the diagnosis clinically. I think patients like tests. They like to know if they're positive. I think as clinicians, um, you know, we like to have a little added assurance, but we don't necessarily need that. It's possible that because of the overlap with COVID-19 and influenza, and because influenza has a treatment and COVID-19 doesn't, that we will be using influenza testing a little bit more uh, this year. I think people will, will want to use a little bit more um, to distinguish those patients that have flu or don't. Uh, next slide. This, this is uh, not meant to be quantitative, it's somewhat semi-quantitative, and it only includes um, three organisms. There are tons of other viruses, RSV and uh, other GI viruses, noro, rhino, uh, enteroviruses that are going to cause illness. Um, they cause illness year round that are going to cause illness this winter. But thinking about the ones that um, are most common, that have treatments, uh, or that were now have heightened awareness of, um, you can have patients that have two or perhaps three of these. Uh, there was a study done at Stanford, I believe it was last February or March, it was published in JAMA in April. And they found that patients who tested positive for, for SARS-CoV-2, a certain percentage of them, it was fairly low, like 10, 15%, also had influenza. Um, they tested for some non-viral organisms, mycoplasma and uh, chlamydophila, and found co-infections with them. The test didn't specifically look at group A beta hemolytic strep, um, but it's probably the case that you could have a patient with a strep throat and influenza. I think most of us have seen that some years. The question is, could you have a patient that actually has all three, that really tiny triangular shape um, 
in the middle. I guess conceptually it's possible, um, but those are the ones that uh, we need to avoid diagnosing with all three just based on walking in the door, somebody doing um, all three tests on them and having them all uh, turn out to be positive. Really, really the key here is that um, in symptomatic patients, uh, COVID-19 and influenza are going to be systemic illnesses. You're probably always, almost always going to have uh, fever, cough, myalgias, malaise, fatigue, those kinds of symptoms. Strep throat, I mean, uh, throat, sore throat can occur with those two, but it's really going to be your main feature with group A beta helminthic strep. So if it's sore throat and fever, you're going to be thinking about that group down at the bottom as well as the other two. If there are more symptoms than that, it's going to move you up into those upper two circles just clinically as in terms of your pretest probability. Um, next slide. I promise this is the last Venn diagram. Um, and this is just talking a little bit more about the symptoms that patients can present with. Um, I think, you know, as I was trying to figure out a way to convey this, um, it sort of makes made sense to me to do it this way. When you have a patient with just fever, you know, that off to the left group there, they could have a lot of things. Um, we use a history and an exam to whittle that down. Do they have urinary symptoms? Do they have flank pain and tenderness to percussion? Do they have a headache and a stiff neck to go along with that fever? Um, that really is, uh, you know, apart from any test, helps us begin to think about what could be wrong with them. Um, when you're thinking about lumped together flu, uh, COVID-19, and uh, strep, you, some patients with strep throat, particularly kids, can vomit. Um, there can be cough sometimes with uh, strep throat also, certainly all of those symptoms can occur in patients with um, COVID-19 and influenza and other viruses. Um, again, I think, I think the main challenge for us is going to be to not overtreat strep throat. And so really think about those patients as primary sore throat as their chief complaint down in that bottom circle uh, with or without fever. So kind of getting into that overlap zone. And those are the patients that you would examine, feel for lymph nodes in their neck and look for redness in the throat, maybe exudates, and then decide to test rather than just getting uh, a strep test in addition to what other tests you're going to do on everybody who has a sore throat. All right, next slide. So what's the downside um, to doing it wrong? And what is doing it wrong? Well, um, doing it wrong is testing everybody who walks in the door for everything without beginning to think about what they could have wrong in the first place to get that pretest probability from the beginning so that your test result makes sense. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but they have a poly pill now for cardiovascular disease that has a, an ACE inhibitor and aspirin and a, a cholesterol lowering medic medication, a poly pill. And I guess we're going to have, uh, somebody's going to invent hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, something else, all in, uh, in uh, you know, Tamiflu or something like that all mixed into a pill. Um, and we'll see if that ever comes out. But the thing we have to avoid is treating everybody for everything, um, particularly based on test results. It's possible, again, that little triangle in the middle of that first diagram that somebody could have all three, uh, that they might need treatment for influenza as well as for uh, strep throat. But those patients are going to be a really tiny group of people. So if you find that everybody's uh, leaving the office with a prescription for uh, penicillin and um, oseltamivir or baloxivir, probably over-treating patients, however you've come to your decision. Um, the, you know, what is doing it wrong lead to? It leads to overdiagnosis. That's a, you know, a false positive clinical diagnosis of a disease that's not there. It leads to overtreatment, which is um, really at odds with our ongoing stewardship efforts in terms of prescribing antimicrobials for patients. Um, you may say, well, you know, who cares? Uh, I, I don't want to miss a, a diagnosis that I could treat in terms of infection. Um, but there are harms that go along with that needless cost and um, patient injury that can occur. And so that, that's really the downside of overdiagnosis. Also, you know, having that kind of COVID tunnel vision that Chris talked about could lead to underdiagnosis. If you only think about COVID, you might miss somebody with strep throat or influenza, and those have treatments associated with them. Um, if you're focusing not so much on COVID and just on flu or particularly strep, you might be under, your underdiagnosis wouldn't necessarily need, lead to under treatment because there's no treatment for COVID, but you might not recommend appropriate isolation for those patients and there'll be excess contagiousness and also uh, 
you know, badness in terms of people dying or having other complications related to the disease because we're missing the diagnosis. So how do we deal with this? Uh, next slide. Really, the, the solution is to focus on some things that I think all make sense to us, and it's not super hard. Um, prevention is key. Uh, what they're experiencing in Australia this year, last year they had a super bad influenza season before we had our influenza season. They, we kind of track after them, Southern Hemisphere. And at least so far this year, they are finding increased vaccination rates. Usually they'll have about 40% of the population getting vaccinated. And this year about 60% got vaccinated. And then people are also being careful because of COVID and they're finding hardly any circulating influenza. So uh, although it's bad for business, um, prevention is key. It will decrease our complicated decision-making. So emphasizing that patients get uh, influenza uh, immunization if, um, if you're offering that or if they can get it elsewhere, starting to mention it to patients this time of year so they're getting their vaccinations in October around that time frame. Um, that's an important part of what we do. Um, the other thing is um, COVID mitigation techniques. I think uh, we've been doing a lot of things naturally now for the past several months that we didn't do before. It was really complicated initially. People were maxing out in terms of PPE wear. We've learned to kind of visit appropriate PPE um, to use. We've uh, devised ways to screen patients before they come into the, the clinic and cohort them, sick patients from non-sick patients. Um, uh, as well, mask wear for clinicians and patients, all of those things that have helped us mitigate COVID will help us mitigate uh, influenza as well, particularly in the office from spread between sick and non-sick patients. But as well, if people continue to distance and do those things at home, we'll hopefully be preventing a lot of disease in the first place. Um, wasn't the case initially, but I think by now a lot of us feel like we're experts at treating this uh, novel uh, virus that's had almost pseudo-apocalyptic uh, kind of concerns initially. Um, but we, what we really have to do, because we've been doing that for the past three or four months, I think most of us are, you know, we still have our uncertainties, but that's what we've been doing. We do need to go back and reacquaint ourselves with the recommendations for diagnosing and treating flu. It's a different disease, similar symptoms, but it has a treatment. Um, the risk factors in terms of people who are going to get severe disease overlap somewhat. Um, interestingly, one of the groups that we don't think about as being uh, higher risk with COVID, but are high risk with influenza is kids. So definitely kids under two or, you know, some, I think some authorities actually put that level up to five years old. Those kids are at increased risk of poor outcome if they have influenza. And we've kind of been minimizing the impact except for a few you know key diseases like uh, MISC um, but kind of having the impression that COVID-19 doesn't affect kids that much we need to back up think about influenza and focus on kids um, and because uh, early diagnosis and treatment is important uh, for those kids so we have to uh, kids and, and anybody with the disease um, I think we need to uh, follow the guideline that if you're going to prescribe an antibiotic for a patient with strep throat, they need to have a positive objective test, uh, either a rapid strep test or a positive culture if the strep's negative and your suspicion is high. And that positive test should be preceded by some kind of history and exam. You're going to have to pull the mask down and take a look at the throat, uh, not only to get the swab, but to kind of look at the characteristics of the throat. Um, and we really shouldn't be prescribing antibiotics unless um, that is the case, and that's still going to be the case in the COVID era. Um, I know in years past, I've worked at places where just for efficiency, uh, everybody coming in with a fever got um, multiple tests before the clinician saw them. And, you know, sometimes you're just going to have to do that. But um, I don't think we, that can be our main uh, patient flow plan. Um, it's going to be best, you know, you might be able to devise some protocols based on patient symptoms to begin with, if it's mainly a sore throat, a strep exposure, maybe with some fever and not a lot of other symptoms, those patients could probably get a, a rapid strep from the start. If they have had COVID exposure or have more systemic illness, probably not a strep swab until um, they're seen by a clinician. Um, and then again, because we sometimes have to deal with that test results before we see the patient, if you're met with some test results that don't make sense after you've seen and examined a patient and had a chance to talk to them, Really, your HP, think about what you would have done if you didn't have the test result 
and you're probably going to make a better decision than just going by what's in front of you in terms of the test results. And then lastly, I would just say patients are still going to have pyelonephritis, um, you know, cellulitis and in a, in a part of their body that's maybe covered up by some clothing. Um, we need to consider other causes of fever and systemic illness rather than just ruling in and ruling out COVID. And again, h &P is going to be key for that. Uh, we have to touch patients and examine them uh, even in the COVID era. I think that's all I got. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Giscano. Greatly appreciate that information from you and uh, Dr. Chow. Um, before we go any further, I did want to announce that Dr. Giscano has been chosen this month as the antibiotic stewardship champion. Um, so the College of Urgent Care Medicine will be honoring him in urgent caring and on our website for this month, and he'll get a certificate for that. If you knew you out there have someone that is also doing great work like this, um, please send it off to the college so that we can honor them as well. Uh, next, I'd like uh, just, Krista, could you add in to talk the conversation a little bit about what's happening in your area related to back to school? Oh, yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you for asking me to join here. Um, it's, we, it's not often that we actually get a pediatric urgent care on these calls, so I appreciate acknowledging everything that we're doing. So I'm located in upstate New York, way upstate New York, far from this city. We're about an hour from Niagara Falls. And um, I'm at a pediatric urgent care center. We've been open for one year now. And uh, quite interesting how we've had to adapt and mold our business model to what's been going on uh, with our new crazy COVID world. Um, initially, you know, we were just seeing kids. And then this spring, you know, we kind of volume hit rock bottom like everybody else everywhere all over the country. And so we decided, you know, we need to kind of do something to help the community reach out, figure out where we can fill some voids of folks that weren't being taken, taken care of. So um, we continue to serve all of the kids in our community, but now we've actually opened up our testing capacity to families. Um, so we're serving parents and grandparents and families that could possibly have exposures and taking care of everybody as a unit rather than just focusing on the kids. And there's lots of business um, positive uh, things about that, but more so, you know, we're here to serve the community in more ways than one. So that's been a way that we've adapted um, for that. Now rolling into school, this has been a very interesting um, time period for us in New York. Now, every state's different, I'm sure, with uh, state mandates and requirements and so forth. But in New York State, um, the state has now mandated that kids that return to school, uh, if any child has a fever and then all this barrage of symptoms, and it could be any of the viral stuff that we see, runny nose, cough, fatigue, sore throat, um, and then the typical COVID symptoms, if they have any one of these 10 or 12 symptoms, um, they have to be on a mandatory 10-day quarantine and they have to have a, a negative PCR swab. So very interesting conversations are happening right now because as clinicians, we all know that that's a little bit crazy to just assume that a kid has a fever and assume that that, that is gonna be related to coronavirus. Um, so we're, we're working on that right now in our community to figure out how to tackle those sorts of mandates. Um, historically, over the past couple months, we, we are completely private practice, not associated with any of the health systems. We uh, partnered with one of the health systems and have been sending all of our tests to them with a one to three day turnaround. Um, last week, we heard that we're going to actually be getting one of the rapid platforms, which will allow us to uh, give results to children and their families and school districts and the Department of Health within 30 to 40 minutes. So yeah, that's a real game changer in my community because we'll be able to really evaluate the kids, meet that state mandate in some capacity. A challenge here though, is for the amount of kids that are going back, how are we gonna be able to service this? How are we actually gonna be able to take care of these kids in the way the state thinks it's gonna happen? Um, that's gonna be really hard to do. Um, so anyways, that's, that's kind of how we're tackling the world right now. Of course, that could change next week if the state mandates uh, change a little bit. But our kids are going back in all the models that uh, Dr. McNeely had mentioned. We have some full day kids going back five full days. My kids are five days, but half days. So they go all in the afternoon for two and a half hours, uh, but five days a week. 
Then we have some districts who are the hybrid model where they have two in school days and then the rest are virtual. So we kind of have a blend of um, different school models, but uh, from a healthcare standpoint, you know, we just have to think about how are we going to handle these kids and their families and the exposures and the vectors and stuff. You know, how are we really going to um, try to do this while still trying to be a clinician and not having having the state kind of run the show and tell us exactly how it needs to needs to work? It's it's going to be really challenging. Well, greatly appreciate your input, your thoughts, and uh, some of the things we need to work, think about. Dr. Chow, what's going on in your neighborhood? You're on mute. Okay. Well, I'm in North Carolina, and I'm in the central part of North Carolina, Raleigh, Durham area in particular, in particular. We had most of our cases in June and July, then we started seeing the numbers taper off. However, in my practice area, we have three universities, and one of them, the University of North Carolina, just made national news because they had three outbreaks in the dormitories that caused them to suspend live classrooms, classes. So I expect that we're going to see an uptick in cases because all the college kids are back in school. We start school in a hybrid model of most of the districts around here. Some of the private schools have already gone back to in-class learning. I believe Wake County, which is our uh, school district, has suspended in-class education till at least October. So, so far so good, but with the kids all coming back from university, we're starting to see numbers pick up again. Now I'm on mute. Um, anything in your neighborhood, Joe, that's any different? You're on mute as well. How about now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, good. So um, my kids are in high school and middle school and actually both remote learning um, five days a week. Uh, I have an older son who goes to um, professional school in San Francisco law school and he's all remote, at least for the first semester. Um, I think California is being maybe a little more uh, conservative, uh, although I'm not aware necessarily outside of what's happening very locally, what they're doing. I'm actually seeing a lot of um, college age kids in the last week or so uh, in practice coming in with this complaint or that complaint. Sometimes it's a concern about COVID and needing to be evaluated before they can go off to school. Um, but, or if they're coming in with something else like poison oak or something uh, unrelated to COVID, they're wanting to get it taken care of before they leave for school in Arizona or Nevada or uh, someplace else. So, I mean, my impression is that in a lot of states, um, particularly in college, it's open for um, students to go there. Now, I don't know, once they get there, maybe they're doing some hybrid uh, or mixture of remote and um, in-class learning, it's possible. Um, but what's going on locally here is extreme uh, conservatism. I think, I think the philosophy has been that that degree of, those mitigation efforts like that, that degree of conservatism has led to the low incidence of disease that we're seeing here. We're still, I mean, in the testing that we're doing, less than 1% of patients are positive. Um, and most of them are not that ill, uh, you know, when you look back to November where patients were a lot sicker with pneumonia and hypoxemia and uh, things like that. So it's um, kind of underwhelming, but with um, uh, maybe overzealous mitigation techniques relative to other areas, but maybe those two things are related and that's why it's that way. All right, thank you. Um, what I'm seeing in Ohio, um, I've got one kid in college who went back already, um, although all her classes except for one are online. So it seems a little strange. She's an hour away in a dorm room doing her online classes except for one. I've got another kid who's not going to start college for another month, but she's doing it all online. Um, my kids in grade school and, and high school, um, they're doing the same type of thing. We've got uh, um, online starting in a couple weeks, and then there'll be a choice for one of those three things. So 
I think it's uh, important to know what's going on in your neighborhood and how things are going and what your prevalence is like. I know here it was uh, very similar to Dr. Chow's area where um, we picked up the last couple of months um, and we are just now tapering off. You know, we were testing in the 5% range to start with and then up to 15 and then down now into the under the double digits. So we're seeing that tape taper off. One important thing that I wanted to mention to everyone is that we are seeing MISC, although MISC stands for children, um, very similar symptoms in adults, and that has recently been uh, put out by the CDC. So if you're seeing unusual symptoms in adults in the inflammation, something to think about. We don't know much about it at this point, um, but something to be aware. So I don't see a ton of extra questions, but if um, please send them in. Um, we have some few here that were sent in before um, that we can talk about. Um, so I'll take any panelists who'd like to speak. Um, what is the optimal PPE for seeing patients with the I can't say the word with suspected COVID disease? Anyone want to chime in? Okay, Dr. Chow, Sean? I'm going to call on you. Yeah, Sean. It, it really depends on if a AGP is expected, that's aerosolized generating procedure, and what exactly is an AGP is still a little bit up in the air. For a patient that comes in without COVID symptoms, I still assume that they could be COVID positive. And in terms of PPE, a surgical mask plus eye protection is suffice with or without the patient being masked. That is the CDC guidelines. Now, if an aerosolized generating procedure is generated, then an N95 mask is recommended. Okay, besides the mask, what about things like face shields or gowns or what are, what are we generally saying? If it's a patient without an AGP, I just go in with a face mask. I just go in with a face mask and eye protection. I use a pair of goggles. If there's an AGP or if the patient is really coughing a lot, then I will add a gown and again with eye protection, either a face shield or goggles plus a N95 mask. That's what I do. Again, the CDC breaks it down into if a patient if you have a greater, if you have a prolonged contact with a patient with COVID, then face mask plus goggles. If it's an AGP, then you need a full full PPE is recommended, including N95 mask. Okay, thanks, Dr. Giscano. Did you want to add in? No, I, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going to say, Chris didn't mention the gowns uh, at first, but I think that if if there's really if, you, if patient's going to be uh, excreting virus, I mean, you expect more um, droplets, then the gown should be added to the mask and face shield. Okay. And one of the important things people are talking about is how we're doing the swab, whether we're doing a deep nasal swab, nasal pharyngeal swab, or whether you're doing a mid swab, a mid turbinate swab, or whether you're doing a um, what type of swab you're doing, or whether you're doing swabbing for. Um, strep, remember, swabbing for strep can also be a risk for COVID. So if you've got that concern, making sure that you've got the right PPE in for all of those um, type of illnesses, um, flu included, um, very important. Okay. Um, another question, a parent calls requesting testing for their child because they received notice that a child tested positive at their school. Krista, could you take that one? Absolutely, because I live this conversation every day, all day long. Um, so the discussions of uh, what an exact direct exposure is, is extremely important to have with our patients. And we have to remember that the CDC defines a direct exposure as an unprotected encounter within that six feet mark, and then for a prolonged period of time, so for 15 minutes. So all day long, we're having these conversations with families saying, you know, tell us about your direct exposure. Did you actually meet those um, sorts of guidelines. If you did, then, you know, you would qualify for testing. Um, but, you know, your mother's grandmother's best friend who was at the barbecue last weekend across the yard, you know, if that person comes out positive and you weren't in that close contact for a prolonged period of time, 
that would not really be covered as, or be considered a direct exposure. So, you know, moving moving into the school discussion where our children you know, are going to be in those close proximities, every school is going to be a little bit different. I know that the districts in my area are trying to um, adhere to the social distancing. We've cut the capacity of the school classrooms down. Desks are spaced out six feet apart and the kids have to wear masks if they're gonna be close to that. Um, you know, an interesting discussion point between a lot of people around here is the idea of having a mask break and uh, so the kids don't have to wear their masks all day long. And when does that happen and when is that safe and so forth. So um, no particular guidelines, these are all just discussion points that are happening in our area, but uh, certainly learning and getting that definition of uh, a direct exposure down and um, feeling comfortable having those conversations with families, you know, that, that's gonna be an important guideline to who to test and who we hold off on. You know, I, I'd you. add too, I'd add too, I, I, I haven't, I don't know if the CDC is still um, considering this, but we are uh, in our county that, that the patient, as Chris uh, uh, described, who qualifies for testing actually should be quarantined um, regardless of symptoms or test result, okay. because that's a close contact and that patient needs a longer term kind of evaluation, even a higher, higher degree of uh, kind of higher degree than self-isolation um, because of the exposure. Yeah, I did peek at the uh, CDC website this morning um, when I was looking for what it means to be exposed. And they did say that if you're exposed, you should be quarantining yourself the same way as if you uh, tested positive. Um, yeah. Other only caveat to that is one of the questions we have coming up is how long does immunity last? And the CDC has said that as far as we know, no one has got it again within a three month period time. Now you might be testing positive, but your symptoms haven't returned and you're not infectious at that point. But we don't really know how long immunity lasts. We haven't, it hasn't been around for an entire year. So how would we know for sure? Um, but that is part of the situation. If you're taking care of someone who's had it, or it has it and you've had it within three months, they don't recommend the testing or the quarantining. But otherwise, anyone who's in close contact, anyone who, let me read it off real quick. Um, if you provided care for someone, if you're in direct physical contact with that person, hugged or kissed them, you shared eating or drinking utensils, they sneezed, coughed, or somehow got re respiratory droplets on you, all sounding fun and pleasant. Um, those are all reasons why we need to be thinking about testing you or at least quarantining you. And those that are at high risk and who are likely to have it, but even that they test negative, I think that's also someone we need to be thinking about. That's that person that maybe the test is wrong. I think Dr. Toscano kind of talked about that, that, you know, pre-test probability, post-test pro probability, sometimes it doesn't vary based on the test itself. And so that's important. Um, another question that uh, was asked, um, is there an optimal way of screening patients for COVID-19? We'd like to take that. Sean, I'd actually like to add something on the previous question. I think the big challenge is what do you do about the asymptomatic patient that may be potentially contagious? And when do you optimally test someone who has had an exposure? That question really is, is very difficult to answer right now. I mean, if someone comes in to the urgent care clinic and says, well, I, I was exposed yesterday, and you test 24 hours later, the probability of enough of a viral load built up to meet detection on a test is low. This has nothing to do with the sensitivity and specificity of the test. You can't detect virus because it's not there. So do you test someone in 24 hours? Do you test someone in three days? Do you test someone in five days? If they're symptomatic, the answer is very clear. You want to test when they're symptomatic. But if they're asymptomatic, you have someone come in and the kid's asymptomatic or the patient is asymptomatic, you know, when do you test? The best evidence right now says five to seven days. Mm -hmm. Test too early, you're not going to pick it up. Mm -hmm. So that, that is one of the challenges that we're also going to have is when a patient comes into urgent care and says, I was exposed, I want to be tested. Well, when was the exposure? That also plays a huge role. Very important point. Appreciate that. Okay. Anyone want to answer the screening patients for COVID-19 question? I think for screening, you have to consider 
it, it really is going to depend on, I think, I, I think it's a very difficult question to answer. You want high sensitivity, and some of the tests can't deliver that, but it also depends on the prevalence of disease. So if in the community there's not a lot of COVID out there, you have someone with minimal symptoms, any of the ambulatory tests, supportive care tests, probably are suffice to rule it out. The problem is as prevalence increases, if it's 10%, 20% of the community, now it's almost impossible to screen out a negative patient. And so initially, it's all pretest probability and prevalence. If it's low and low, then the negative test is good. If the prevalence starts increasing, you're probably going to need to go to a PCR test. And even then, you might still miss one or two. Okay. So very important to, um, once again, think about what is the likelihood of disease? Um, what is the prevalence in your area? What is the patient's symptoms? Have they had exposure? and then decide, because we know that testing isn't the end-all, be-all, and if the test was 100% sensitive and specific, life would be great, and we'd be able to do that and just test everybody. But the reality is that we have no test that I know of that's 100% sensitive and specific. Um, so um, we have to kind of keep our head, wits about us and our heads about us as to what to test and when to test. Okay. Um, another hey, good John. question, if a person... Oh, yeah, no, go, ahead. Go, ahead. Sorry. go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I, I think the other challenge, too, is that Sometimes we really don't know the true prevalence of the disease in the patient population or patient state because we don't really know what the classic symptoms of COVID in children are. We may be overestimating or underestimating the prevalence, and we don't even know it. And that influences how you interpret the test. So there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unknown here. And I'm, I'm sorry I can't give any more definitive answers. John, I think, I think you um, sort of summarized really well. There's probably three things to think about in terms of, and when you say screening, I mean, I, I think you're probably talking about what's the chance of this person having COVID. And, and we hear reports of people with no symptoms who have had no exposure who have it. So we know until this thing goes away, you know, that, that it's not zero, I guess, and just anybody walking around there. But, but to really emphasize it, it has to do with the disease prevalence in your community in general. Um, it has to do with whether that patient has any known exposure. Now there might be unknown exposure, but if you have somebody, you know, like Chris had described, who's been with somebody for 15 minutes unmasked within a six foot um, distance, particularly if that person's symptomatic or if they subsequently test positive, that's a, that's a, you know, that's a, a definitive exposure. And then there are symptoms. So yes, you can have no symptoms and still have it, but the more symptoms you have that are suspicious for COVID, fever, cough, myalgias, you know, systemic type illness, your, your chance of having these disease goes up and then you can use a test result maybe to help you make a decision. I think in terms of symptoms, a lot of them are nonspecific and overlap with other uh, diseases. So it makes it a little bit harder. The kind of, um, specific symptoms that we're hearing about are this loss of taste or smell. Not, you know, I can't, I don't think I've ever heard of that with anything. I mean, when you get a cold, you kind of lose your taste of, you know, your sense of taste and smell, but we've never really talked about it before. And it may be that that's one of those kind of screening things that, although not that many patients have it, it should be part of what we're routinely asking people. And that's going to heighten our, uh, our screening of them, you know, before we get to, to an actual test result. Oh, Sean, I think you're uh, muted. I'm muted. So one of those things that's very uh, specific but not sensitive, the, uh, right. exactly. the loss of taste and smell. Very important yeah. to think of that. So yeah, when you got that, you need to be thinking about it. I think all, all our hospital systems around here are asking that if everybody walks in the door and if they have that, that's kind of a Hey, go home and we'll be looking to look at you. Um, I have one more question. We've got uh, only a few minutes left. If, for example, a person comes in and they look like they have strep and they test positive for strep or they look like they have flu and they test positive for flu, but they've also had a potential exposure or a likely exposure, there's a high prevalence of COVID in your area. 
What are you guys doing? Are you testing? Are you thinking about it? Or are you just sticking with the same one? Why don't we go with Dr. Toscano first and uh, get a thought from you? Yeah, so so I'm I'm going to assume it, it looked like the patient had strep and flu to begin with, and that's why you tested and you've got those positive test results. Is that Was that the patient you're talking about? So I'm assuming that a person has one or the other, not both. Okay, I got gotcha. you. So, I mean, you really don't, you, you know, you, I guess yeah. it, it probably is a little different, but I'm trying to squeeze two questions in at once. The questions gotcha. are if you've got strep, and you could have COVID, do you test? If you've got flu, yeah. and you could have COVID, do you, do you test? Um, I guess answer both of those if you would. Right. I mean, I think think probably COVID, I, I talked about the, you know, the kind of cautions against overdiagnosis, but overdiagnosing COVID may be, particularly because we don't have any treatment, there's no harm in having somebody isolate and be more careful. Um, I think maybe that there's not too much harm in overdiagnosing COVID. You may have a little bit of a freak out factor. Um, but that's maybe the one thing that um, we don't have to be quite so, quote, careful about. So I would say if you had somebody who has an infection already, uh, particularly an influenza-like illness with or without a positive test result, and COVID's either in the community or they had some sort of an exposure, um, I, would, I would counsel them as if they had COVID as well. Um, you know, to isolate, come back if you feel worse, which we're kind of telling everybody anyway. Um, strep, I guess, maybe a little bit different. If they, if they just have fever and sore throat, no COVID exposure, there's not a lot of COVID in the community, you look in their throat, it looks like strep, and you get a positive swab, um, you know, that person still has to isolate and be careful about contagiousness. But in that case, you probably don't have to freak them out quite as much with COVID. They may want to test, you may test them. Um, again, your pretest probability is kind of low in that situation. So it, you'd feel good about a negative test. If you get a positive test, um, just have the person be more careful. Okay. Chris, any additional thoughts? Um, yeah. So in the, in the pediatric population, this is going to be interesting rolling into this in the school season and theme with this talk here is, you know, we get a child that uh, comes in looking like strep, we get a positive strep, but there's a possible exposure maybe in school or something. Um, I think that we are going to, in this population, going to see a, a few more requirements from the schools and, and health departments to rule out other things, um, just to make sure that the child would be safe to go back to school um, after the completion of, you know, a couple days of antibiotics, let's say for strep throat or an ear infection. So I think in the, in the kids, as we roll into school, we may be seeing more testing than we're used to just to rule out COVID um, in more cases. Okay, thank you. Dr. Chow, additions? I think in this day and age, it's not unreasonable to over screen or over test for COVID. It, you get some surprises. I know the plural of anecdote is not evidence, but my first COVID patient was a young adult that came in with sore throat thinking she had strep test, thinking she had strep, and we did a COVID test that was positive, but the strep test was also positive too. So that was the freak out factor, but that was my first COVID patient in urgent care ever. Uh, I think that there's a lot of requirements, whether they're rational, real, or wise, by either a school or employer to demonstrate a negative COVID test. And so I think the pressure is going to be to continue to get that COVID test and to have a negative COVID test. The good news is if you have an alternate diagnosis like strep, or it looks like strep and it's positive, as Joe said, the pretest probability is very low, so a negative test is most likely to have a very high negative predictive value. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I wanna thank our panel today for all the great work that they did and all the information they shared with us. I wanna thank all of you for joining us, and I will turn it back over to uh, Laura Stomina. Sure. Well, this concludes today's town hall on urgent care implications of students returning to school amidst a COVID-19 pandemic. I want to thank our panelists, our facilitator, and the attendees for joining us today. Um, please join us for the next COVID-19 town hall, where we'll take a little bit of a different approach, and we'll be addressing provider stress and burnout as we enter what they're now referring to as the twindemic of flu and the COVID-19 season. 
Uh, we'll be featuring a, a physician. He's actually with the Studer Group, who is a national expert on this subject. Um, so watch for more information. As of today, we're planning the town hall at 1 p.m. on September 15th. So we'll get that out there on the calendar and UC access. Once again, that will be uh, free. Um, so we would also want to remind you about the AFM uh, with Dr. Toscano and Dr. Trine and, uh, and uh, a physician from the CDC uh, that we mentioned in uh, the introduction. So with that, we conclude today and have a wonderful remainder of your day. Mm -hmm. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.